Tonight we're going to continue our study in the first epistle of Paul, the apostle, to Timothy. We spent some time on verses 1 and 2 and verses 3 through 11, but now we find ourselves in verses 12 through 17 in a message I'm entitling, The True Minister in Ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. You ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Jesus. And Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you are in the business of changing people's hearts and lives. Really. Lord, we live in a broken world and our hearts are attacked. Lord, we know that we live in a time where so many people make so many different claims and the Bible makes the most outrageous claim of all, that there's help and hope and mercy and grace and forgiveness for people who want it and need it. And Heavenly Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to people's hearts. Lord, we pray that we could be drawn into your presence. Lord, we pray that we would not be content to just simply hear the words of the Bible. And simply content to believe them. But that somehow we would hear and believe and we would allow that to connect us in a meaningful way to the person of Jesus so that our lives would be changed. And so, Heavenly Father, again, we commit this time to you. We pray that you would awaken within our hearts a profound sense of love and gratitude for all that Jesus has done. We commit this time to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You might want to read along with me. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, if you have your Bible. Paul writes, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. In the opening of this letter, Paul calls on Timothy to defend the faith in verses 1 through 11. And now defines the minister in verses 12 through 17. Paul is going to appeal to his own commission and conversion as an example of God's grace and an example of God's love, an example of his mercy and salvation. Paul draws on his own testimony again to provide this sharp contrast between the false teachers that he's condemned in the opening verses and himself. In this short section, Paul tells us, what God did in verse 12, and then again in verses 14 and 15. When God did it in verse 13. Why God did it in verses 16 and 17. What did God do? He selected Paul and saved Paul. And when did God do it? When Paul was Saul. Not when he was a good person, not when he went to church, not when he decided to change his ways, not when he decided to be a different kind of a person. He saved Paul when he was violent 
injurious, a blasphemer, a persecutor of Christians. Why in the world did God save Paul? And I'm sure there are lots of reasons that we could give. He provides the intellectual foundation of all of Christianity. Other than the Lord Jesus Christ, he's arguably the most important person in the history of Christianity. We could list lots of reasons so that we would have Romans and first and second Corinthians so that we would have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. We could let the list go on and on and on. But Paul offers this explanation of himself to provide a pattern, an example. Paul is going to basically say that God was willing to demonstrate his amazing grace in the worst of sinners. Paul has already condemned those false teachers who pervert the law of Moses, fail to understand the purpose of the law. The law serves its purpose when it reveals and condemns our sin. The false teachers wanted to impose the law of Moses on the believers in Ephesus. Paul wants to impose Christ on the believers in Ephesus. And Paul offers this explanation that God did this to provide a pattern, an example that he himself would be the test case, if you will. This is interesting. Paul is going to illustrate the lawful use of the law by his own testimony. Remember, he said to them, you don't understand the purpose of the law. It's to expose who you really are so that you will come to Christ. And then he's going to share a little bit about who he is. He is going to point to himself like a stained glass window where all the colors of mercy and grace and love come alive in this mosaic of beauty that sinners can be saved. And I'm going to suggest to you, remember, remember, that Paul wants to give Timothy guidance and encouragement. But I'm going to also suggest to you that he wants to provide inspiration. And so look at verse 12. Paul, placed in service by the Lord Jesus, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Paul begins by reminding Timothy that Jesus is the one who placed Paul into service. If you read the book of Romans, if you read the opening letters of his general epistles, he'll say, Paul, a servant of Jesus. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus. Paul, a slave called by Jesus. He's not simply chosen by the leadership of the church. He's not a self-appointed leader. He doesn't wake up one morning and decide, hey, you know what? I think I would be good in the ministry. Paul didn't choose the ministry. It chose him. He didn't choose the ministry as a vehicle for self-enrichment. He didn't choose the ministry because his parents thought, hey, you know what? Given who you are and what you do, this is probably a great job for you. Paul is placed in service by the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is this important? Because the false teachers were self-appointed. They were placed by themselves. Paul uses the word enabled. Look what it says. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. Enabled has come to mean something far different in our culture and our language. If you're an enabler, it's not a good thing. It means you are trying to support people in wickedness or, or something that's gone wrong. But the word translated ena- enabled is an interesting Greek word. It's in dunamo santi. That means it has a root word, a prefix, and a suffix. All that big long Greek word means to strengthen. To strengthen. 
by imparting power. That's what the word means. It means to impart strength in order to make a provision of power. The power comes from Jesus. This power isn't self-generated. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me, strengthened me, empowered me. This isn't something artificial. This isn't something superficial. This isn't something emotional. This isn't something personal. Paul uses the same term in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, in that very, very well-known passage where he says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Same word. Jesus placed Paul in ministry. Jesus empowers Paul for ministry. And no person has the ability to conduct God's business apart from God's power. And so it doesn't really matter what I say or how I say it. I can get up here and talk with you and pray with you and remind you of all that the Bible says. But unless the Holy Spirit is present, conducting supernatural business inside of your heart, I have no power whatsoever. The self-appointed minister is ultimately doomed to failure. The self-appointed person who says, I'm going to do what I want to do in ministry probably isn't going to get good results. The minister Jesus selects is the one that he empowers. And guess what? He can't fail. And so can a self-appointed minister provide some physical support, some emotional support, some, some kind of support? And I'm going to suggest to you that the answer is yes, or perhaps. But who can save a person from sin? Who can remedy the problem of death and judgment? Who can make the invisible, eternal transaction that must take place inside of a person's heart? Only Jesus can do that by the power of the Spirit. I've often said, if I can talk you into something, someone a little more clever than me can talk you out of it. This isn't simply a process of persuasion where I'm trying to get you to believe that what the Bible says. The Lord Jesus placed Paul in service. And the expression counted me faithful or judged faithful translates yet another Greek word. Hegesado. It means considered. And so when it says counted me or considered me faithful, the reason why this, this word is an important word, it's actually a word that has less to do with judgment and more to do with relationship. Why is that important? Because Paul doesn't think that he's earned God's mercy. He doesn't believe that he has earned God's favor by being Sincere, even as a sinner or as a misguided sinner. But that even this call and commission was due to God's grace. There wasn't something extraordinary about Paul, although there really was. But in his humility, he is not willing to go there. Paul doesn't rationalize or glorify his rebellion and disobedience to God. Paul is placed in the ministry by Jesus. Paul, Paul's purpose is established by the sovereignty of God. He counted me faithful. He's empowered by Jesus. And then in verse 13, look what it says. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief, Paul does something remarkable. 
He doesn't paint a picture of himself as a different guy from the false teachers. And this is important. He's already exposed the false teachers for what they are. Paul doesn't say they're wrong and I'm right or they're, 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 they're evil and I'm good. Actually, Paul says, I'm a sinner. He identifies himself as a sinner. Can we exaggerate or sensationalize or glorify our past sinful behavior? I think that that's possible. And I think that Paul is going to try and create a balance. Not to talk about the sensational wickedness that was a part of his life, but to point out the reality of who he was. And this becomes important because Paul who grew up a Jew and who was raised a Jew and who became a Pharisee, <clears throat> a rabbi and a teacher of the law, is not going to appeal to Judaism or law keeping as the source of the transformation in his life. The New Testament paints a less than flattering picture of Saul or Paul. Prior to his conversion. Prior to his conversion, he was known as Saul. It's Saul who holds the coats of men infuriated with Stephen's testimony. We're introduced to Paul in the book of Acts as we find a young, zealous rabbi receiving the coats of the people who are going to take off the outer garment so that they have the freedom to pick up the stones and put Stephen to death in Acts chapter 8 verse 1. It says in Acts chapter 8 verse 3, Saul began to destroy the church. It says that Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. It says that he went from house to house. He dragged off men and women. He put them into prison, Acts chapter 8, verse 3. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's apostles, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Paul testified concerning himself, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prison both Men and women. You know what that? It's a profound lack of compassion and sensitivity. He says, I don't care who I have to kill to get rid of this wrong teaching. According to his own testimony in Acts chapter 26, he says in verse 10, many of the saints, I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Do you understand what he's saying? I brought them to court. We accused them. And when, all, when people were asked the question, all in favor of putting them to death, say I. And he goes, I. He says in verse 11, and I punished them often in every synagogue. I compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them, even to foreign cities, Acts 26, verse 11. I wasn't content to just hurt them in Jerusalem. I wasn't content to just simply to go to the northern part of the, of the Galilee. I went to every nook and cranny, every village. I would go to the surrounding neighborhoods. And when God is finally going to get a hold of them, he's ready to go to a foreign country to root them out and kill them. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 13 he says, I persecuted the church of God and I tried to destroy it. So why does Paul designate himself as a recovering blasphemer? I shouldn't assume that everybody knows what the word blaspheme even means. It's a person who uses all means and every mean to make Christians renounce their faith. A blasphemer is the person who finds out that a person's saved and goes, 
you know, I, I used to smoke marijuana with you, or I used to drink with you, or I used to party with you, or I used to do this with you and that with you. And there's a sense of urgency as you're trying to drag the person back into the circumstances that they, that they came out of. What is a blasphemer? It's a person who tries to use every mean available to get people to not believe, to renounce their faith in Jesus, to turn away from the gospel, even if that means facing persecution. No observant Jew would intentionally speak evil of God or slander God. But Paul realizes that his vicious attacks on the person of Jesus and the saints are in fact a vicious attack against God. That's borne out by the book of, of Acts when Paul is on the road of, to Damascus and he hears a voice from heaven, from heaven saying, Saul! Saul, why are you persecuting me? And remember Paul's response? Who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. And Paul realizes suddenly, dramatically, fundamentally, irrevocably, that the person, the people that he's been persecuting are Jesus' people but that Jesus takes it personally. Every person that he hurt, every person that he hit, every person that he killed, every person that he tortured, every person that he put to death, he was breaking the heart of Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus and he was persecuting God. He understood that it was God who was speaking to him from heaven. Paul broke the first half of the Ten Commandments and then he broke the last half of the Ten Commandments. The word insolent that he uses to describe himself means someone who violently is aggressive. It's the Greek word high priestess. It's used only here and in Romans chapter 1 verse 30 where it's translated despiteful. This is a word that you would use to describe in a court to a judge when you're trying to get a restraining order against someone who has threatened to hurt you. The words suggest someone who's bloated with pride, who heaps insults on others, or does some shameful act, or, or who engages in some serious injury. Paul demonstrates his humility by his admission of guilt prior to his conversion, prior to his transformation. Paul was not a Jewish apostate who rejects the teachings of the Pharisees or the law of Moses. He is a Jew. He is doing everything a Jew could possibly do in order to earn his salvation. He grows up in a Jewish home. He reads from a Jewish Bible in Hebrew. He gives alms to the poor. And by his own admission, he characterizes himself as lost and damned. If you don't believe me, reread Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 and 7. Here's what he says, quote, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, his words, blameless. But what things were gained to me these I have counted lost for Christ. Everything that I grew up with, everything that I knew, everything that I trusted, everything that I believed. Some of you grew up in a home like that. You may have grown up in a religious home. You may have grown up in a Roman Catholic home. You may have grown up in some other kind of home. You may have grown up in a, in a home where they honored the Bible or where they dishonored the Bible. Whatever home you grew up in, you grew up in with an idea that certain things were right and certain things were wrong. Paul understands that if what Jesus says about himself 
from heaven that he was absolutely and positively wrong. Paul's claim to ignorance, by the way, isn't a claim of innocence. So when he says in chapter 1... In verse 13, although I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. He's not using his claim to ignorance as a claim of innocence by reason of ignorance. Paul's claim of ignorance is not an excuse to deny guilt. It's simply an admission that he didn't understand the gospel. He didn't understand the truth. He didn't understand the identity of Jesus. What do you mean? He didn't understand that Jesus was the Lord. He didn't understand that he was God in the flesh who came down from heaven. He didn't understand that, he, that God become a, became a man. He didn't understand that he was going to die a sacrificial death. He didn't understand that the types and the pictures that he grew up with were shadows of the truth that there was a God who was trying to reconcile sinful human beings to himself. He didn't understand. He didn't understand the mission of Jesus. He didn't understand the meaning of his death and his resurrection. Paul was honestly trying to protect and defend his religion and his worldview. Just like some of you that grew up in a Catholic tradition or grew up in a Protestant tradition or grew up in a cultic tradition or who grew up with atheists or agnostics, who grew up with drunks, who grew up with people where there were no borders and no boundaries, no matter what circumstance that you grew up in, if it wasn't biblical circumstances and God honoring circumstances, it makes perfect sense that you're growing up in circumstances where you don't get it. John MacArthur writes, his willing repentance when confronted by Christ is evidence that he had not understood the ramifications of his actions. He truly thought he was doing God a service. Acts 26 verse 9. Remember Jesus said that they would persecute you and that they would hound you and that they would hurt you and that they would be thinking that they were doing God a service. And Paul's claim to ignorance isn't also an excuse to say that he doesn't need forgiveness. Like all sinners, Paul needed a savior. Well, he's religious. And he said he was blameless. Wait a minute, he's a religious person. And he's, a, he's basically a good person when he's not hunting down and killing Christians. But that's the point. But his memories of blasphemy, persecution and injury don't overwhelm him. You know, sometimes the memories of rebellion overwhelm and haunt the sinner. Some people grew up in circumstances that were so wicked and so evil and so wrong. There was so much pain and there was so much abuse and there were so many things that, that were done wrong that these wicked things come back and haunt us and overwhelm the saint. But Paul isn't going to focus on all of the things that have gone wrong in his life. He's going to now focus on the transformation that takes place because of what God has done in his life. In verse 14 it says, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. The grace and faith and love were the massive doses of medicine that were necessary to provide the cure to navigate his way out of his sinful condition. Can you imagine growing up in a world where you're taught to believe that if you go through the motions of your religious rituals, if you believe what the religion says, and if you do what the religion says, and if you are a basically good person, then everything should work out fine. 
but Paul was lost. Grace, faith, and love turned Saul into Paul. Why is he saying this? Remember, in part, it's in response to the Judaizers and the false teachers who are trying to impose upon the people that there's something other than grace and love and faith that merits some kind of recommendation. This isn't grace or faith or love in the abstract. This is in the concrete of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is turned around and transformed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Simply put, grace is God's loving forgiveness by which God grants salvation apart from any personal merit on the part of those he saves. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Again, if there was any hope that a religious tradition could save you, this would be the opportunity for Paul to say it. Paul crams in this single sentence all the elements of salvation, grace with faith. Faith includes a voluntary and sincere change of mind by the sinner that causes the sinner to turn to Jesus from their sin. That's repentance. Faith comes by hearing the message of Jesus. Remember, he's going to write that to the Romans. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. For by grace you're saved, he says to the Ephesians, through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any person should boast. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus, in the sight of God our Father. Over and over in every congregation, he reminds them that yours is a friendship and a fellowship with God. Yours is a relationship with God based on faith, based on grace, Based on love. What does that mean? Warm, fuzzy feelings in your belly? No, this is the love that's demonstrated by sacrifice. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, Here in his love, in that while we were still sinners, God sent Christ. He's not talking about love in the abstract. He's talking about love in reality. A real Jesus comes and he dies. And the love of Jesus is revealed in the sacrifice of Jesus. The love of Jesus is revealed in the sacrifice of Jesus. And so you hear him talk about blood. The thing that makes so many people uncomfortable. Why does Christianity have to be such a bloody thing? Why does somebody have to die? How barbaric is that? And when you read the story in the book of Genesis of the rebellion of Adam and Eve, how they disobeyed God, and God kills an animal. Not Adam and Eve. God slays the, the animal. God skins the animal. And God covers your mother and your father in a bloody garment and gives them a promise. Salvation has always been by blood. Salvation has always been by grace. Salvation has always been by a person. Faith is the Holy Spirit's act and attitude towards Jesus. You know, we use that term very loosely. What faith are you? I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Protestant. I'm a nothing. I'm an atheist. But faith in the Bible is the evidence of things hoped for. Faith is the Holy Spirit's act and attitude towards Jesus. According to the Bible, faith is what is inside of you as you consider who Jesus is. Faith in Jesus is more than just simply believing that Jesus exists. Remember James writing and he says, devils believe Jesus exists and tremble. Faith 
is even more than believing what he says is true. If a person says, I believe in Jesus, is that evidence of faith? Not necessarily. If a person says, I believe everything that Jesus says is true, is that evidence of faith? Not necessarily. Apparently, whatever faith is, it isn't just simply believing that he is, and it isn't just simply believing that what he says is true. Apparently, whatever this is, it's something that brings us into a vital, living, union real relationship, friendship, and fellowship by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is union with Jesus through the Spirit. We're able to hear and do what he says. When Paul spoke of the labor of love in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, it, it's the hard work and toil and effort that pleases God. It isn't working for your salvation. The patience of hope speaks of the endurance of the believer. And so Paul continues as he's pardoned as a pattern for the, for the future saints in verse 15 and 16. Look what it says. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Is this biblical proof that Paul was a Native American? This is not the meaning of the word chief in this passage. Paul, by the way, will use the expression faithful saying three more times in the letter to 1 Timothy. And then again in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 11 and again in Titus chapter 3 verse 8. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 it says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. In chapter 4 verse 9 he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior Savior of all men, especially to those who believe. And then again in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, he says, This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. What does all of this mean? What is this expression? This is a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. Most Bible teachers and scholars believe that this is a summary of a key doctrine that was constantly repeated to the Christians, to one another, over and over and over again. This is something well known in all of the churches. This is something that is accepted without dispute. And so when Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Somebody might say, I thought Jesus came into the world to give us information because we were confused. I thought Jesus came into the world to provide for us the best example of what it means to live like people should live, like the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Of all of the stuff that he says on the Sermon of the Mount, Paul says, no, this is why he came, to save sinners. Paul's self-designation as a chief literally translates a word ranked first. So when he says, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, he's not saying that he's the worst human being who's ever lived. He's not saying that he's Jeffrey Dahmer, worse than Jeffrey Dahmer, that, that he'll sexually assault you, cut your head off, stick it in a refrigerator, leech the flesh off of your skull. And you're thinking, man, that's awful. That's what he did. That's awful. Of course it is. The point seems to be a reference, oddly enough, I think, to the Jews. And to Israel. 
I suspect that Paul hints that his conversion is a type or a picture of what's in store for Israel as a whole, as a people, and as a nation, that the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Jews, and Gentiles. Paul speaks of himself as one born out of due time in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. It's a word in the, in the Greek language which means stillborn. It means prematurely delivered. It, it's as if I hadn't come to full term, given prematurely. And so the sense is, is a premature arrival or what William McDonald calls born again prior to the rebirth of the people of Israel. Just as he was saved by a direct revelation from heaven and apart from human instrumentality, so perhaps in this sense, in this way, the Jewish remnant will be saved during the coming tribulation period. This interpretation seems to be borne out by the words first and pattern in verse 16, unquote. I don't disagree with William McDonald's insight. I think that it does mean that, but I don't see any reason why it can't mean more than that. I don't see any reason why the insight to salvation is simply restricted to the Jewish people. Does Paul's conversion mean something to the non-Jew, to the Gentile? And I think that the answer is yes. I think his conversion means that God is in the business of changing people. That something happens. Something fundamental. Something on the inside. Do, do we place a violent murderer who persecuted the church and do we put him in the front of the line? But Paul puts himself in the front of the line. I want you to think about this. He says that Jesus comes not for good people, but for bad people. Not simply for people who do what's right, but people who have done things that are terribly wrong. Whatever Paul used to be, Jesus changed all that. This would be a good time for you to insert your own testimony. Who were you? What were you? Where did Jesus find you? How did he save you? What happened in your life? The change in Paul doesn't occur because he, because he kept the law. But rather by God's grace, through faith, in love, Paul offers his own experience as proof that the gospel is for sinners in verse 15, rather than for those who claim to keep the law. He says in verse 16, however, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul's point, why should anyone believe in Jesus? Paul is brilliant, articulate learned and Paul's answer is not simply because the gospel is true it is true but because he saves people he saves sinners he comes into their life when they pray that prayer, when they receive Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of them, there is a fundamental change. There is a reorientation of thinking and speaking and living. There is a sense in which now the Bible comes to light and life and you begin to open up the Bible and you read the story of Jesus and it's like you're reading it for the first time. It's like the, that you were in the dark and now the lights have gone on. Why should people believe in Jesus 
The gospel is true, but he saves sinners. Paul's testimony, by the way, is repeated six other times in the New Testament. Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 26, Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 3. Why do you suppose there's this repetition of the story over and over and over again? It's because Paul doesn't want you to simply believe on the basis of what has theologically or historically been given. Paul preaches. Jesus came into the world according to the Old Testament. All of the prophecies concerning his life is true. He was born of a virgin. He's born in Bethlehem. He is Raised in the Galilee, he says the most wonderful things that have ever been said. He does the most incredible things that have ever been done. He heals the sick. He opens blind eyes and deaf ears. He raises the dead. He cleanses the leper. And when they kill him, he comes back to life. In Paul's testimony, I grew up at that time. And I opposed him. I had every opportunity, just like any other Jew living at that time, and I didn't believe him, and I didn't love him. As a matter of fact, I remained faithful to Judaism, and I persecuted Christians, and I hated them, and I was figured out ways to get rid of them. And and I wasn't looking for Jesus, and I wasn't going to church, and I wasn't going to the library trying to determine if any or all of this may or may not be true. He is headed for Damascus in the hopes that he can arrest and kill more Christians. And the sky parts and Jesus speaks and supernaturally in grace and mercy shows up in his life and tells him that what he's doing is wrong. And everything that he believed was wrong. And something incredible happens. He's blinded and he's taken by hand into Damascus where he meets a man named Ananias and God tells Ananias, Saul's one of us now. And he goes, are you sure? Because this guy, this guy, I know him and I know his reputation and everything that he's ever done is awful. And the Lord reveals to him that I'm going to raise him up. And that he's going to speak to kings. And he's going to take the message to the whole world. That God had a plan and a purpose for him. Paul points to a gospel that saves sinners. And Paul invites you to consider him as the poster child. Meant to display God's grace, God's mercy, God's patience. Paul was living, breathing proof that no matter how wicked, no matter how disgusting, no matter how terrifying, no matter how perverse, no matter how evil, no matter how misguided a person is God is merciful. God is long-suffering. In what sense? God says, Paul, that God waited patiently for him. And God's willing to wait patiently for you. Through the rebellion, through the disobedience, through the running, through the hiding, through the denying, through the disappointments. God is long-suffering. And it's a reference to God's patience with people. And the word pattern is interesting. Um, Countries that mint coins will often produce what's called a pattern. And the pattern will serve for the basis of the shape, the content, or the device on the coins and printing. They They call a pattern the first proof. For those who make dresses or, or 
are involved in that kind of stuff, you, you know that you have a pattern that you cut out which serves as the template for all that you're going to do in the future. Does Paul provide a kind of proof for future converts? I think that the, that the answer is yes. Paul obtained mercy. Is that mercy available to me? God was patient with Paul. Is God going to be patient with me? The Bible says that he's patient with all who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. God is patient. God is patient. God is patient. So how do we obtain salvation? We trust him. We believe in him. We believe what Paul says about him. We sang it during worship. And so, look what else it says, praising the Savior now and forever. In verse 17, it says, now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I want you to think about the context. Paul has provided an example of himself that God is in the business of saving people. And as he describes what God has done in his life, he bursts out in a song of praise. We used to sing this, this verse. We would sing, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. And we used to have one side of the church go, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. And then we would sing it and sing it and sing it because Paul is praising the Lord for what he's done. This verse belongs in what theologians call the doxology. The doxology is just a theological word which means our ability to praise him. We're hard pressed to know if God, if Paul is singing to Jesus or if he's singing to God or if he's singing to Jesus as God. Jesus is the king eternal. He is the one immortal and for the time being invisible. But in this context, some Bible teachers think that the term is a term for God. But whatever the meaning is, it must mean that Paul believes that the Father is God and that the Son is God and that the Holy Spirit is God and all of them deserve wisdom and honor and glory, eternal and uninterrupted. Do you know what's happening here? The saved person will magnify God and praise him. Not simply get into a theological argument of who he may or may not be. Is God an invisible, unknowable force who's distanced himself from creation? Is God part of a pantheistic unity like the force in Star Wars? Where everything is God and nothing is God like Buddhism teaches. The very fact that Paul refuses to distinguish which person of the Godhead is being referenced, in my view, strongly argues that all the persons in the Godhead retain all the attributes of God. And that's why we sing, we believe in one God, eternal. This is why since the beginning of Christianity, in the Apostles' Creed, we'd say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, one with the Father. There aren't three gods. There's one God forever, ever existent in three distinct persons. The doxology isn't simply a teaching tool so that we'll be aware of the attributes of God. Paul, in a mental and emotional and a spiritual outpouring of worship and praise, is glorifying the God who brought him out of darkness into light, who made a sinner a saint. Most of you are familiar with the story of the person who wrote, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, 
that saved a wretch like me. You know that he was a sea captain. You know that he trafficked in slaves. You know that he was wicked beyond all description. And one day he got drunk and he fell overboard. And in order to save his life, his, one of his shipmates took a whale harpoon and threw it into the water. And the harpoon pierced his hip and went all the way through it. And they literally drug him back into the ship after harpooning him. Do you think you might have a come to Jesus moment? He did. What's his name? That's exactly right. John Newton. John Newton had an amazing encounter with the living God. He prayed to Jesus. He prayed that Jesus would forgive his sin. He prayed that Jesus would come into his heart. He prayed that he could experience forgiveness and hope. And he left the slave trade. And he became the pastor of a church. And he wrote the song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The words magnify the Lord. Eternal, immortal, invisible. He makes reference to wisdom and honor and glory forever. Psalm 42, 8, trust in him at all times. Psalm 34, 1, I'll bless the Lord at all times. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. Blessed is he that does righteousness at all times, Psalm 96, 3. My soul breaks for the longing that it has unto the judgments at all times, Psalm 99, 20. He maintains the cause of his people at all times, 1 Kings 8, 59. The Lord give you peace at all times, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16. Trust at all times, praise at all times, love at all times, righteousness at all times, godly desires at all times, faithfulness at all times, proper concern at all times. Is it possible? Is it even possible to give God too much praise? Is it possible? to be too grateful? Is it possible? I don't think so. Augustine wrote, man's chief work is the praise of God. Francis Schaeffer used to tell his students, and I read in one of his books when I was in college, one day all Christians will join in a doxology and sing God's praises with perfection. But even today, individually and corporately, we are not only to sing the doxology, but we're to be the doxology. What Francis Schaeffer meant by that is we don't just simply look at this verse and sing now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. That we become the source of praise. That it is with our minds that we love him. It's with our lips that we praise him. Because you've indeed changed. You're different. It wasn't religion. It wasn't Judaism. It wasn't keeping the law. It wasn't familiarity with the Hebrew language. Are all of those things good things to have? I think so. But none of them saves you. Let's refresh. Paul, placed in ministry. Why is this encouraging to Timothy? Because just like Paul was placed in ministry, so was Timothy. Paul, empowered by Jesus for ministry. 
What about Timothy? We're going to find out in our very next se section that that's exactly what happens. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Paul pardoned for ministry. But so is Timothy. Paul a pattern for ministry. And so are you. How is Paul saved? By grace through faith. How are you saved? By grace through faith. What role does faith play? What role does grace play? What role does love play? And so Paul praises God. Has God saved you? There's really only one of two answers. Yes, he has. Or no, he hasn't. Has God placed you in ministry? Has, has God empowered you for service? Has God pardoned your sins? Are you a pattern of grace and faith and love? Paul will challenge and remind Timothy that the same Jesus who placed Paul in ministry placed Timothy, empowered Timothy, pardoned Timothy, and is willing to use Timothy to the praise and honor glory of God and he's willing to use you to the praise and honor and glory of God what's your place in ministry what's your source of power what is your testimony have you experienced the pardon for sin that demands praise to God for what he has done. You know, in the course of our study, I'm going to give you glimpses of my testimony. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have not. But that's for another time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we consider Paul's words and Timothy's challenge and the reality of what it means to be a Christian and to love you and to walk with you, we're reminded, Lord, that it's you who places us in ministry. It's you who empowers us for ministry. It's you who pardons our sin. It's you who gives us the ability to praise you. And so, Lord, we pray that that would be our life, that it would be marked for life. That we would become the doxology. We would become people who praise you. And so again, Father, we commit this time to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And again, I want to invite that person who for whatever reason doesn't know you and doesn't love you. Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would invite them, that they too can have grace, mercy, love, that they can come to you by faith, that they can turn from their sin, that by faith they can acknowledge that there's something wrong, that, that sin is in their life, and that Jesus is willing to save them. And that they can cry out even now and pray a simple prayer. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you came to the earth to save sinners and to forgive sinners. And I want to experience that grace and that mercy and that forgiveness in my own heart. I want to experience cleansing. I want to experience the pardon of sin. And in that washing and cleansing, I want to be free to thank you and praise you and offer gratitude for what you've done in my life. And if that's you, and if you've prayed that prayer, you should come up. You should see me. You should tell me that you prayed that prayer and I can help you, give you some tools and some resources to walk an incredible walk that God's called you to. Let's stand.